morning. morning. Got those Bibles. We're going to read them today. Philippians chapter 2. This morning, we'll begin looking at verses 5 through 11. Starts on the bottom of page 981, and then we'll finally be on to page 982. Uh, This morning, we come to one of those passages that as a preacher, you're tempted to just read and then sit down and shut up. You can't do better than this passage. This is a passage that makes me feel like Isaiah. When Isaiah gets a vision of the glory of God and cries out in 6.5, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's a reverent, fearful humility. Remember humility last week, low-mindedness. He said that humility is a right view of oneself in comparison to God. Humility takes into account our finiteness and sinfulness in light of God's infiniteness and holiness and cries out, Woe is me. He is holy. I am not. Isaiah knows that. And he sees God in all his glory and he is un. Done. This passage before us this morning is one of the clearest displays of the glory of God in Christ. This is a passage that I cannot do justice to. This is a word from God and of God of which my words will fall woefully short. This is the heart of the letter. This is the center of the whole thing. Uh, the greatest passage in the letter, one of the greatest passages in all of Scripture. This is Mount Everest. Now, you can't tackle Mount Everest in a day. So we're going to have to give ourselves a couple of weeks to work through these wonderful words. The passage before us in itself, it's it's, it's pretty simple in outline. Verse 5, you're going to see an exhortation, a call, a command. uh, Have this mind. Verses 6 through 8 then are going to be about the humiliation of Christ. And then verses 9 through 11 are about the exaltation of Christ. Exhortation, humiliation, exaltation. And notice how nicely structured those second two are. You have three verses given to the humility of Christ, three verses given to the exaltation of Christ. In fact, there's so much goodness here, verbal, literary goodness here. There's there's enough poetic qualities to these verses that many are convinced that this is an ancient Christian hymn to Christ. Not written by Paul, but used by Paul in his letter. We're not going to spend any of our time sorting out whether or not this is in him. It doesn't ultimately matter for us if it did, if it was. It doesn't matter for our understanding of the text. Because either way, this is inspired scripture. I'm not convinced that it's a him. I don't think there's enough. I think this is pure Paul at his best. Yes, it is somewhat poetic. Yes, it sings and it soars. But that's what good doctrine is. Does. And this is the best doctrine. This is simply who Christ is and what he has done. Which means that this is the center of everything. The whole Bible is about who Christ is and what he has done. Much of the Bible gives it to us only in hints and shadows. Philippians 2, 5-11 through 11 is like just this big, bright, and blazing spotlight of clarity. Here's Christ. But don't forget also that Paul gives us this in context. Paul has called the Philippians to let their manner of life be worthy of the gospel. That means standing firm, standing fast, striving for the faith of the gospel. That means to do it together, and that means to do it unified. And then last week we saw that the key to unity was humility. Unity comes through humility. But why and how could we ever be so humble. Paul's argument is simply because of Christ. So we're going to look at his exhortation in verse 5. We need to sort some stuff going on there in verse 5, but then we'll focus on Christ's humiliation. I'll explain that word later in verses 6 through 8, and we'll break those three verses down by looking at the identification of Christ, then the incarnation of Christ, and finally we'll close with the crucifixion of Christ. Identification, incarnation, Crucifixion sums up the humiliation of Christ. But first, let's read, and then let's pray, because guys, this this is gold. But we can't and we won't see it unless God opens our eyes. Your job is to open your physical eyes. Your job is to focus. 
follow along. Give yourself great attention to the text. And then let's let, ask God to open our spiritual eyes so that we can see and delight in the glory of Christ in this text. Let me read it for you, and then we'll pray. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is what God has to say to you today. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you would bow with me, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, show us Christ. Father, help us to focus. Help us to look and listen. Help us to understand the, the grammar and the structure and the meaning of the text that is before us. But Father, most importantly, we ask that you would give us spiritual sight. You would give us an open heart and open ears to hear and perceive uh, the glory of Jesus Christ as he has revealed to us in these words. Father, my words are so insufficient to explain what it is that we have before us. So we ask and we depend upon your word. We ask and we depend upon your spirit, Father, to work now through that word in this time. Show us Christ. Help us to love him as a result of what it is that we see today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we start again with an important theme that we began to look at last week. We'll start with the mind. Let me remind you that Paul used the word mind three times in verses 2 and 3. Being of the same mind and of one mind. And remember that the Greek word translated humility literally says low-mindedness. Now then, we have Paul's fourth use of mind in this passage. Paul is after unity, and he knows that it starts with the mind. It starts with right thinking. As we mentioned before, starting in 6, we are in rarefied air. World-altering, glorious gospel truths are about to flow from Paul's pen. But there is a context to those truths. They do not come in a vacuum. Paul pins these truths with a purpose. And that purpose is connected to verse 5. Which means that we first have to get verse 5 right before we can rightly understand what Paul is trying to accomplish with 6 through 11. And that's a little challenging because there's some slight disagreement over how to take verse 5. Now, I may not always succeed, but I try to leave out many of the unnecessary scholarly debates over a text. But this one's not unnecessary. But we need to pause and take a little time on the grammar of verse 5 because I think that there's something the ESV gets right that some of the older translations miss. And I think it's really important to Paul's argument. All right, I need you here with me for a couple minutes. Thinking caps on. Focus. Hopefully there'll be a payoff. You need verse 5 in front of you. Look at it. Look at it. It's, it looks simple. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, remember, Paul wrote this almost 2,000 years ago. He wrote it in Greek. We are reading in English or Italian or whatever you're reading in, whatever language. So we're reading a translation of the original Greek. And sometimes there's a couple of different ways that you can interpret a passage. Uh, listen to how the King James translates verse 5. If you've got the King James, look at it or I'll read it for you. Or write this down if you've got the ESV and maybe it'll help you notice the difference. Here's the King James. Let this mind be in you, which was also... In Christ Jesus. One more time, the King James. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you see the difference? ESV, have this mind which is yours. King James, have this mind which was Christ's. That's different. The King James takes Paul as saying, be humble because Christ was humble. Right? Be like Christ basically what verse 5 
is saying. If you were to pull up our new website, I wrote up a little summary page about the mission of our church built off of the first four words of 1 Corinthians 1.23. We preach Christ crucified. That's our mission. Nothing else. A church faithful to the scriptures doesn't get to pick what it's about and what its mission is. Jesus told us in the Great Commission, make disciples. And we do that by preaching Christ crucified. And in the midst of my explanation of the four components of our mission statement, I wrote a two-line summary. The second line says this, we do what we do because of what Christ has done. Right? So our mission, what we do, is determined by Christ's mission, what he has done. That's kind of what the King James translation of verse 5 is saying. Our activity is determined by Christ's activity. We are to be humble because Christ was humble. And then boom, verse 6, Paul goes on to describe the beauty of that humility. Here's the example of Christ. Go and do likewise. That's, that's, that's not bad. That's not wrong. Christ is our example. Paul is calling the Philippians to be like Christ. Justification always demonstrates itself in sanctification. Faith works. New heart always leads to a new life. Be like Christ. That's right and good. But what if Paul is saying something even more than that? Because look at the ESV. And I want you to notice the difference. The ESV doesn't say, have this mind, which was also the mind that Christ had. It says, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's different. And it's potentially wonderfully different. Grammar time. Grammar is good. Grammar to the rescue. You know your nouns and verbs at least by now. In English, one of my secondary goals of preaching is to teach you basic grammar. Because they don't teach it in schools anymore. Look at verse 5. The verb is have. And mind is noun. Have this mind. Verb, noun. Technically, in the Greek, there's just one word. And it's mind and it's a verb. So there's just four words in the Greek of the first part. Most literally it says, think this in you. Remember, you in the New Testament is almost always plural. Think this in you all. Or you all think this way. Have this mind in you or among you all. Second phrase. Look at it. You see the verb there. In the ESV, it is is. In the Greek, there is no verb. That's, that's normal. In Greek, it's a different language. Paul will often use a phrase expecting us to understand that phrase and supply the verb. That doesn't really work in English. It's a different language. So translators supply it for us. And here's the difference. Here's where it comes in. The King James supplies a was and connects it to Christ, which was yours in Christ Jesus. But again, there was no was. Context has to supply the missing verb. And generally, when the verb is missing, you can expect it to be the same verb in the previous parallel phrase. And if that's the case, we take the think verb from the first part and we slide it over to the second part. So Paul wouldn't be saying, you think this way because Christ was this way. He would be saying, you think this way, which is the way you think in light of Christ. In light of your union with Christ. Or have this mind among yourselves, which is the mindset that you have in your union with Christ. And the kicker is at the end of the verse. This is what determines it. Did you catch it? It's our little buddy again there at the end. In Christ. Remember, Paul doesn't ever call us Christians. He refers to us as those who are in Christ. One, one, the saints in Christ. Christ Jesus, 2-1, if there is any encouragement in Christ, 2-5, which is yours in Christ. So the ESV gets what Paul's doing. It nails it. He is saying, have this mindset, because in Christ, this is the mindset you have. You do have it. In light of your union with Christ, he's saying this is true for you. This is not some reality that you need to create yourself. This is a reality that you have been given by God in the grace of Christ. And now he's saying, live it out. Foster it. Manifest it. So it seems like a small difference, but it's not. It's huge. Paul is not saying, hey, you see Christ there? You know, he's God. He humbled himself. He gave up everything to serve others perfectly. You see that perfect self-sacrifice? Yeah, you better go and do that. 
or else. I almost feel like in some of the preaching, there's always this implied you're else sometimes. Maybe that's just me. Again, we are being called to imitate Christ. That's right and good and true. But it's how Paul does it that is so often missed. He's not just saying, do this. He's comforting and he's reminding us of the wonderful things that are true for us and of us in Christ. He's reminding us first of the new identity that we have in Christ, of the security that we have in Christ, that we have been so identified with him that we can rightly say that we are in him and he in us. That Paul can say, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so Paul is making it clear that Christ has come to give us not only an example to follow. It's not just our activity that's determined by his activity, but that he has also come to ransom and redeem us, to rip out our cold, dead hearts and give us new and living hearts. Paul's point is that if you are a Christian, you have this mind. You have been given to it. We have Christ's mind. So he's saying, be who you are. Live it out. Express yourself. Express yourself as who you are in Christ. And so that's why, back to the mission statement of the church earlier, the second line has to be the second line. We do what we do because of what Christ has done. That's incomplete without the first line. And the first line says, we are who we are because of who Christ is. He doesn't just determine our activity. He determines and defines our identity. And he does so by giving us new identities, by giving us his identity, by making us new and uniting us to him. So Paul is not saying, have this mindset because this is the mindset Christ had. He's saying, have this mindset because this is the mindset that you do have, that you have been given now that you are in Christ. Church, unity because you have unity. This is objective reality. Now live it out subjectively in your life among yourselves. Do you see the difference? Is it just me? I, I love this. Listen, let's be clear. The example of Christ can be, huh? be careful, the example of Christ can be the worst taskmaster in the world. The example of Christ, wrongly understood, can be totally and utterly crushing and crippling because the example is perfect. Absolutely perfect. And so, so much of preaching does not make this distinction and says, hey, you see that perfect thing, Christ? Be like that or else. And that's, that's devastating. Because you're not. I'm not. It's obvious. You can't be like that. You are far from perfect. As far as the east is from the west, so far is your goodness from Christ's goodness. So we must be very carefully to parse this out and get this correctly. The example of Christ without the grace of Christ will kill you. Right? Be very clear. If you are here this morning and you are not a Christian or you are not sure, this is not how you become a Christian. It's not be like Christ. It's not clean up your act and be a better person. It's not try harder. All of those things are impossible. All of those things will get you to hell. The gospel is different. Salvation is different. What we're about to see in the person and the work of Christ is the only way that you can be saved. The death of Christ is the only way that you can be saved. So this isn't just a call to be like Christ. This is not an ancient version of the WWJD grace. Right? That, that whole craze wasn't particularly helpful. This is once again Pastor Paul encouraging and reminding the Philippians of what they have in light of their union with Christ. They have the very mind of Christ. And so he calls them to un unity through humility. He reminds them of the one who so perfectly demonstrated that humility for them so that they could have that unity with them, so that they now have that unity with one another and then can spend the rest of their lives living out that unity together. Don't be like Christ. Yes, do be like Christ. But Paul's not saying that. He's saying you are like Christ. You have been given the righteousness of 
Christ. You've been given the unity that comes with that. Live like it now. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's move on. Let's go from Paul's exhortation now to Christ's humiliation. And first, we need to sort of that word, humiliation. We think of, we think of being embarrassed or, or being ashamed. Uh, that'll be part of it. We'll see that. Uh, but the word comes from the Latin uh, humilis, which simply, again, means, remember, low or humble, which actually just comes from the Latin word humus, which just means earth or ground. Humiliation, then, most basically means to be brought low, to be brought to the ground. So keep in mind what we've been talking about, humility, which literally is low-mindedness. This is what Paul is calling the Philippians to. And humility is, again, it's central. It's fundamental to the Christian life. The great Augustine was once asked in a letter uh, to list uh, some of the central principles of the Christian life, and he responded to this young man. He said, the first, humility. The second, humility. The third, humility. Sounds pretty important. According to Augustine, the greatest theologian who ever lived after Paul, it's the first, second, and third thing. Why? Because of Christ. It's because of the humiliation of Christ. Because he was brought low. But to appreciate the humiliation of Christ, we have to first understand the identification of Christ. Look at verse 6. It says, Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's, that's who Christ is. And it's a simple enough description, but it's full of mystery. And it's full of wonder. This, this is the central claim of the Christian faith. Everything else hinges upon this. If this is not true, then the whole thing is a scam. And you should leave now. But if this is true, and if you claim to believe that this is true, and this changes everything. And this should change everything about your life. Jesus was in the form of God. That's a bit of a strange way to put it, though. But what is Paul saying, and why does he say it that way? Uh, the word form, morphe, means form or shape, and the sense of, of something's essence or the essential characteristics. When I was a kid, the, the mighty morphin Power Rangers were big. Now, it was too cool. I knew it wasn't cool. I didn't watch it. I watched it a little bit. Um, but I was aware. Right, what did they do? They, they morphed. They changed form. That's what to morph is. Well, we get that. But what does it really mean that Jesus was in the form of God? We don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess. Paul tells us. He explains what he means in the first phrase with the second phrase. Look at it. He was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Form equals equality. All Paul is saying is that Jesus was equal to God. This claim is all over the New Testament. And as I said, it's the central claim of Christianity. Christ is the central claim of Christianity. This is what separates us from everything else. But not just Christ as some wise moral teacher, not Christ as example, not Christ as one religious leader among many, but Christ as God himself. This is why Jesus is not like Muhammad or Joseph Smith or Buddha. Every single one of them claimed to teach the way they were wrong, but they claimed to teach the way only Jesus claimed to himself be the way. And that's because he was God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 2.9, in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Love that. Deity dwells bodily. Hebrews 1.3, He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. When Thomas finally sees and understands who Jesus is, he cries out in John 20, 28, My Lord and my God. This is the central confession of the Christian faith, that Christ is my, that Christ is our Lord and God. Before you can appreciate what comes next, you have to see and be stunned 
by this, before you can appreciate the activity of Christ, you have to appreciate the identity of Christ. He is God. There's a brief, there's a brief scene uh, in John's account of the betrayal and arrest of Jesus that I think we just often gloss right over. In John 18, the mob approaches. Uh, it's dark. The Pharisees and the soldiers are trying to figure out, hey, which one of these guys is Jesus. And so they ask. And Jesus replies, I am. Do you remember what happens? They all fall to the ground. Everybody falls to the ground. That's strange. Now, these are the power players. These are the religious leaders. These are the soldiers. They're carrying weapons. And at a word, they all collapse to the ground. Why? It's probably because in identifying himself as I am, as Jesus does throughout John, he's claiming the divine name uh, for himself, God's name revealed in Exodus 3.14 when God says, I am who I am. Jesus claims that for himself. And here he must, in John, be giving them in some small way a, a glimpse of, of his true identity, of his di divine glory. They got some sort of hint of his being in the form of God. Their maker has spoken to them, and it is a word of weight and authority. It is a word that they cannot even bear, and so they collapse. They've come into the presence of God himself, and they cannot stand. They cannot even stand. They're not the ones in control here. He's not the victim. He's the one orchestrating the whole thing. And he gives a brief demonstration of that in that brief moment. He is God. And even having emptied himself, which we'll come to, when he, when he begins to pull back the curtain just a little bit, they are utterly undone. They saw something of his glory and couldn't stand it. And you know what's even more amazing? After that, after whatever it is that Jesus just did there, they get back up, they dust themselves off, and they proceed to arrest him and torture him and kill him. Doesn't that seem insane? Doesn't that seem to be the height of foolishness? We think, oh, if I'd seen that, I would have believed. I would have done uh, what they did. But you think of all the things that all these people uh, could have seen at the time of Jesus' uh, ministry. Water miraculously turned to wine. He cast out demons, the lame walking, the dead raised to life. Thousands fed with crumbs. John says at the very end of the gospel, Jesus did so many things that the world couldn't even contain all the books uh, where they all written down. These people saw many of those things and they didn't believe. These guys saw some sort of glimpse of Christ's glory and then they killed him. And you are no better. You have now read Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And whatever happened there, you have now seen far more, far more clearly than any of those soldiers did. You now have Paul's wonderfully clear explanation of exactly who Jesus is and of exactly what he has done. You know now, you've seen, and yet how quickly are you to reject him and turn from him and chase after other things? We are often no different then the soldiers who dust themselves off after a glimpse of Christ's glory and then proceed to execute it. That, that's what the preaching of God's word is. It's not about me. It's not what I do. It's, it's, it's the word itself. You are right now getting a glimpse of Christ's glory. That, that's what this is. Right? That's what the word of God does. Right? We sing the song, Show Us Christ. Oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word. It's because preaching is supposed to be not, hey, let me give you all some tips, I'm going to tell you some fun things and say some jokes. It's that we take God's word and we open it up and expose it because it's God's word that exposes us to God. That's what the word is for. We cannot see Christ with our physical eyes, but we can see him with our spiritual eyes by grace, and we see him here. It's astounding, if you think about it, that God has chosen for his glory to be revealed through reading. God's glory is revealed through reading. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. Wonderful passage. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image 
from one degree of glory to another. That's how we change. It's only by beholding the glory of the Lord. It's not ten steps to your best life now. It's not here's all these things. It's by beholding the glory of the Lord. We, we see His goodness. We see His greatness. And the spiritual sight that God gives us then gives us a spiritual desire for Him, which increasingly creates in us a spiritual delight in Him and a spiritual life lived to Him. That's not our focus right now. My question is, in the context that Paul's writing, how do we behold the glory of the Lord? Well, three verses earlier, Paul's talking about Israel's failure to see Christ for who He is, and Paul writes, for whenever Moses, and that means the law, the first five books of the Bible, he says, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. You see, Paul understands and expects that it's the reading of God's word, which is the means by which we see Christ's glory. They can't see it because of the veil, because of their sin. We can't see it until God's grace removes the veil, gives us a new heart and new eyes. But the point is that Paul is making, though, is that seeing happens through reading. That's it. That's God's glory. And that's what we're doing right now. We're taking the text of Scripture, we're reading it together, and my job is to try to open it up and explain it and entrust God's Spirit to take that and give you eyes to see the glory of Christ is revealed in His Word. And man, it's especially revealed in this Word. Do you see it? The identity of Christ in the very form of God. He's God Himself. That's who we worship. That's who we're here for. That's what everything is for. And if you truly see, and if this is who He truly is, it will affect you. And it will change you. It will give you a love for Him that will lead to a life for Him. I think sometimes, maybe, we don't really love Him as we should because we don't really understand who He is in all His greatness and in all His glory. Ask Him to show you. It starts with prayer. Right? It starts with a dependence and a humility that says, I can't do it. I need God to show me. So ask Him... But then give yourself to the place where God does show you. Here. Read the Word. Meditate on the Word. Come to Sunday hungry to hear the Word preached and explained and taught. And ask God, show me your glory through your Word. That's what this is for. So the identification of Christ. He is God is the central claim of our faith. But then it just gets even more amazing, because let's keep going. Next one. We've seen who he is. What did, we, what did he do? We've seen identity. What about the activity? Back to verse 6 again, the second part. He was in the form of God, but did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now what does that mean? You're looking at the King James you'll see that it says, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I love that. Robbery. It's a fun Greek word. It's used only here in the New Testament, and it comes from a verb meaning to snatch or to seize by force, and the noun came to mean plunder or, or booty. Right? Booty, pirate's booty. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm morally opposed. My wife told me not to do this. I usually listen to her. I think she's wrong on this one. We can talk after. No, I'm morally opposed to potty humor. and We don't do it in my home. Uh, it's not allowed. But one of Emma's favorite jokes is, what was the pirate's favorite song? It's shake, 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 shake your boot. Right? That one's pretty harmless. If you get upset about it, fine. Come talk to me. I apologize. But it's a good play on words, and it's a good explanation of what this word actually means. No, it's not. This is funny. Uh, but what this word means in the pirate sense, in that secondary sense, it literally means plunder. It means prize. As Jesus, what it's saying is, Jesus didn't count equality with God as a prize or as a plunder, meaning he didn't count it something to be grasped for his own personal advantage. He didn't count it as something to be used to serve himself. And remember, that's the whole thrust of Paul's argument in this passage. Look back at verse 
3. Remember how Paul told them to pursue and promote uni unity. He says, count others more significant than yourselves. Well, now we have that same word here. Christ did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Paul is telling the Philippians to consider others, to esteem others more significant than their selves. That's the humility. That's the mindset, which then works itself out in verse 4, looking not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then again, verse 6 through 7, that's exactly what Christ has done for us. And you've got to keep verse 5 in mind, right? What's so amazing about verse 6 is verse 5. What's amazing about the humiliation is the identification. God, Paul's taking the same word, count, count. He's explaining verse 3 with verse 6. God himself in Christ, in a way, is counting others more significant than himself. How? By not taking advantage of of his godhood and seeking uh, by not taking advantage of his godhood to serve himself but to serve us he's saying that god serves man no one else says that. no other religion claims that god serves man how how does this mindset of humility not accounting equality a thing that he grasps how does it work itself in action how does he serve us verse 7 look at verse 7 Here's how. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That's how. That's the incarnation. The incarnation is how. What does it mean, though, that, that Christ emptied himself? There's been a lot of confusion uh, over the course of church history about this. A lot of very bad theology uh, as a result. Uh, the Greek word is kenosis. It just means empty. And there's been all these various attempts to explain what does it mean that Jesus emptied himself, called often kenosis theory. And there's all kinds of things. Jesus, they'll say he, he set something aside. He, he, he emptied himself of something uh, by subtracting something in a sense. Or he, he laid aside some of his attributes of deity, like his omnipresence or his omnipotence or something. No, that's not at all what the text is saying. Jesus did not and cannot set aside any of his attributes. He was truly and fully God in every way, but he did empty himself. How? Paul tells us. He explained. The text always tells us. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. That's how he emptied himself. Jesus, in emptying himself, didn't set something aside. He took something on. This is not addition by subtraction, but in a sense, this is subtraction by addition. Jesus, who was in the form of God, Jesus, who was God, took on flesh. He became a man. That's, just, that's what the word incarnation means, in flesh. He came in the flesh. That's how he humbled himself. Look at the beginning of verse 8. He was found in human form. Same word for form of God in verse 8. Six. So Paul's making it clear. Jesus, verse 6, was truly God, and now, verse 8, he was truly man. He becomes one of us. God Almighty, transcendent spirit, becomes limited, imminent flesh. Right now with the girls at night, uh, we're reading through uh, C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. I just end on an island. Nora kind of wanders and plays. <laughs> Still working on the three-year-old. Uh, but every kid should read those books. We're only on the fourth book right now. But there's this great scene in the last book uh, towards the end. It's called The Last Battle. And what happens in this last scene, just to summarize it quickly, is there, there's a barn. And they think there's something really, really bad in the barn. barn. So the heroes are going to enter into the barn expecting to face this, this kind of terrible thing. And it turns out that as they open the door and they enter into the barn, inside it's simply an entrance to another whole world. It's just like the first story in which the four children enter into Narnia through a little wardrobe. And now they're entering into a whole world through a little barn. So it's as if the little barn contains that whole world. And so when they enter in, they see it, they look around, they see the sky and the grass. One of the characters first exclaims, he says, it's, it's inside is bigger than it's outside. To which Lucy, who's kind of the main human character, she's from, she's from Earth, she's from London, Lucy, the first to enter into Narnia, 
in the way back says this. She says, in our world, too, a stable once had something inside it that was bigger than our whole world. Oh, that's, that's excellent writing. Inside that little bubble was something bigger than the whole world. And not just the barn, but inside that little physical body. And not a little physical baby body, that little physical grown-up body. Remember, it probably wasn't very big. Uh, studies have estimated that the average ancient Near Eastern male at the time of Jesus would have been about five feet tall. Right? Imagine Jesus, not much taller than Juliet. Right? Imagine Jesus, a uh, little guy. I don't know. No offense, Miss Juliet. I don't know. I don't imagine Jesus about that size. I bet that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. It's because we want our Jesus strong and strapping. We want him imposing and impressive. We want him perfect flowing locks, some sort of odd androgynous attractiveness, generally white. We have all these images of who we think Jesus should look like, and yet he was probably this tiny little guy. Not big, not impressive, not beautiful, not physically striking in any way. And scripture confirms this for us. Isaiah 53, 2. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Form. Form. Philippians 2. And this is precisely the point. This was the empty. This was the humbling. But we can't appreciate the meekness of the outside if we don't first see the majesty of the inside. Inside was something bigger than the whole world. Inside was the creator of the whole world. Inside was the sustainer of the whole world. The identity of the Son, the deity, divinity, infinity, eternality, majesty of the Son is what makes the incarnation the most amazing thing that has ever happened. God has become man. I was tempted to force Andy to sing a Christmas song in June because I love I love the line in Heart the Herald, the angels sing, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. I think it's one of the best lines ever written in a hymn. It's too bad only to do it at Christmas. The Godhead, divinity, veiled in flesh. Deity, clothed in humanity. And they could see him. John, first John is like three times at the beginning. We've seen him. We've seen him. We've seen his glory. They could see God. And so the song says, hail him, praise him. Uh, worship him. God has become man. That's the humiliation of Christ. What was high has come low. But that's only the beginning of the humiliation of Christ. Because God has become man for a very specific reason. Last point. Look at verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. The humiliation of Christ culminates in the crucifixion of Christ. This is why he came. This is why he became a man. We've seen the identity. Here's the activity. The point of incarnation was crucifixion. He didn't come to save, serve people. He didn't come to heal people. He didn't come to feed people. He didn't come to set things uh, right at the time. He came uh, to die. This is the true humiliation. Of Christ. The word is even in there. He humbled himself. And that's the verb. That's the same word Paul uses back in verse 3. In humility. There's so many parallels between 1 through 4 and 5 through 11. It was low enough for God to come down to us and become man. But he didn't stop there. Christ humbled himself even to this point. Death. Not just death. To drive home his point and the humiliation, Paul repeats and expounds even death on the cross. Guys, we're so used, we're too used to the cross. We wear the cross, we decorate with the cross, we put it on t-shirts, we put it on bumper stickers. We've been inoculated to the offense of the cross. To us, the cross makes complete sense. To them, 2,000 years ago, this was scandalous. This was humiliating. We cannot understand the shame that was associated with the cross. It was forbidden 
for Roman citizens to be crucified. It was such a horrible, uh, humiliating way to die. Romans wouldn't even talk about it or utter the word. It was such a disgrace and offense. And to the Jews, the claim that God, the very author of life, could be strung up on a cross and die was the height not, was not just absurd. It was just good blasphemy. And yet for Paul, and for the early Christians, it was the message they proclaimed. It was the message we stole from Paul for our mission statement, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. We preach Christ crucified. We, our, our very mission is defined by the humiliation of Christ. He says again in 2, 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, because this is the thing. The, the central claim of the faith is Christ, that God has become man, but not just become man, but that he has come to die for man. This was the gospel that was of first importance to Paul. This is the gospel that was the power of God for salvation. Jesus died. Why? Notice that word. Again, whenever they, whenever they put it in a strange way, stop and ask, well, why do you put it that way? Notice the word obedience. What does it mean? that he became obedient to the point of death. Why didn't you just say he died? He died on a, even on a cross. No, obedient. Well, again, I think in part it's because Paul is going to use that word again to transition to his next section. You'll see obedient again in verse 12. We're going to see it in light of Christ's obedience. Here's our call to be obedient. I think that's part of it. But I think there's something else going on, uh, something that time limits us from looking at in great uh, detail. But I think... I think this is pretty clear. It's really neat. Why obedience and death? Why did Christ have to come at all? It was because of Adam. This is why we read Romans 5. Go to Romans 5 as we close. Romans 5, 12 through 21 again, page 942. You make a really, really good case that Paul is doing a lot of Genesis and that Paul is doing a lot of Adam here in this passage. But we don't have time to look at it in great uh, detail. But I think... I think that's what Paul is doing. Romans 5, 942. Start at verse 19. Don't forget, Paul wrote both of these passages. This, these are both Paul. I repeat myself a lot. You probably hear the same things. Well, Paul repeats himself uh, too, so I'm all right. And because of verse 19, look at 19. Here's why obedience to the point of death. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made Righteous. So there's Christ's obedience again, coming from the same author. Obedience to make many righteous in Romans. Obedience to the point of death in Philippians. But now why death? What's the connection between obedience and death? Skip back up to verse 12 of Romans 5. Just look up above. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's Adam. That's the first Adam. This is what we looked at last year in our, our previous book study back in Genesis 3. Remember how foundational Genesis 1 through 3, 1 through 3 is to everything that follows. Here Paul is picking up on it, even in Philippians 2. Adam sinned. Adam is our head. He is our representative. God said, obey me, Adam. Obey me about the tree, and you will live. Disobey me about the tree, and you will live die. What happened? Satan came. Satan twisted. What did he say? He called it into question in God's word. That's where it always starts. Did, did God really say? And then he flat out denied God's word. He will not surely die. But what does he say will happen when they take it? He says, you will be like God. So what does he do? She sees takes, she seizes, she grasps. You see, if Philippians 2.6 is probably also a reference back to Adam, that's what sin is. They did count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so they seized it. And they took it. They wanted to be like God. You want to be like God. Every time you sin, that's what you're doing. And so they sinned, they rejected God, they disobeyed his word, and they died. Sin came into the world through Adam, and death through sin. Disobedience 
brought death. Therefore, how can there be life? Only obedience. Only bad news. You can't do it. Because you're already a sinner. You're already dead. So you need another Adam. You need a second Adam. Another head and representative. But this time, this Adam did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was God, but he humbled himself, and he obeyed even to the point of death. Because of you, for you, for me, we, we owe death for our sin. Either you will pay for it with your death, or Christ will pay for it with his. That's why God became man in Christ. That's why the identification led to the incarnation, led to the crucifixion. Because it was the only way for sinners to be saved. It was the only way for the dead to live. Jesus came to take our place, to take our sin, and to take our death so that we could live. That's the gospel that is salvation. That's it. This is the heart and the soul of theology. This, this is the high point. And it comes at Christ's boat. Do you, I, just, I promise I'm done. Oh, I'm so close. Do you see what Paul's just done here? This is so good. I, I, I know. Some of you think I'm probably a little too into doctrine. It's, oh, it's too much. Too much doctrine. I, I could probably illustrate a little bit more. I could probably apply a little bit better. I'm working on it. But do you see what Paul has just done? Paul wants them to be humble. Say, hey guys, you need to be more humble. He wants them to get along better. In chapter 4, verse 2, we're going to see that there are two ladies fighting. They can't get along. They need to reconcile. So Paul's, Paul's basically saying, hey guys, you see that little problem that you've got? You're kind of arguing, you're not really getting along. Let me drop the glorious gospel of Christ on that. Let me take that small little thing and drop Mount Everest on it. Let me compose for you the greatest description of the person and work of Christ for you. So great and so beautiful that in 2,000 years, people will still be arguing over whether or not this is poetry and song. And that's because doctrine sings and doctrine unites because doctrine is about Christ. You can't love him if you don't know him. That's what doctrine is. He doesn't give them four steps to fix and reconcile and repair their relationship. He gives them Christ in all his glory. He gives them exhortation through identification and incarnation and the crucifixion of Christ. Because that's what they need. And that's what you need. The most profound truth in all of Scripture is also the most practical truth in all of Scripture. Because if you have this mind, if you see it, and if by the grace of God you live it, you will be humble, and then you will be united with the people of God. You want to change? Look to Christ. You want to kill that sin? Look to Christ. You want community? Look to Christ. You want unity and humility? Look to Christ who is unity and humility, who has given us unity and humility through his work in our place. And so Paul says simply, believe. Faith, trust, be who you are in Christ. Live it out in light uh, of Him. Live it out in your life and in your relationship. Have this mind. Christians, this is the mind that you have in Christ Jesus. Let's close with a word of faith. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we've only just begun to unpack this passage. Help us, Lord. Show us. Give us eyes to see. Father, do what is utterly impossible for me to do. Do what is utterly impossible for us to do for ourselves. Simply ask that you would give us the eyes to see Jesus Christ. Father, give us hearts to know him. To love him. Forgive us for how cold, forgive us for how apathetic and how forgetful we are so quickly. Father, use this continual exposure to your word and the continual exposure to the gospel of Jesus Christ to shape us 
and to transform us and to make us like Jesus in every aspect of our hearts and our minds and our lives. Uh, do your work now for your work. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.